Welcome to Navigating the Customer Experience. Want to improve your organization's customer service? Looking for insider tips to knock your customer socks off? Then you're in the right place. Here's your host, Yannick Grant. Welcome to Navigating the Customer Experience. On today's episode, we have with us a very special guest, and her name is Karen Millsap. Karen is the founder of the community Grow Flow, and at only 29 years old, she suddenly became a widow when her husband, Richard, was tragically killed. On her journey of healing, she discovered immensely effective habits and lifestyle changes that helped her find her way back to a whole heart. Karen is also the founder and CEO, and her CEO stands for Chief Empathy Officer of Agency, a training firm that helps organizations create a human-centric culture with compassion and empathy. Her team has developed and designed workshops that teach simple, effective ways to create a people-first workplace. Her client list includes NBC's Golf Channel, Sprint, HubSpot, Universal Studio Resorts, and many more. So without further delay, welcome, Karen. Oh, thank you, Yannick, so much for having me. I'm excited for this conversation. <laughs> awesome. Okay, Karen, so could you share with us a little bit about, you know, just give us a little background. Um, just to, to let the audience know, I first phoned Karen on Good Morning America when Robin Roberts was interviewing her a couple of weeks back. And I was so impressed that we actually have people out there that are called grief consultants. And it was amazing to hear that she was using her pain. She's channeled it into good to go into organizations and train leaders on how to effectively communicate with their team members and build better teams. So um, could you share with us, you know, how you were able to make that transition? You know, um, what are some of the obstacles you may have faced and how it has helped you to, you know, add value to other people's lives? Sure, absolutely. Well, unfortunately, this knowledge and this passion came from the tragedy that you mentioned when my husband Richard was killed. And at the time, I was working in human resources and recruiting for a national home building company. So my background up to that point had been in HR, but touched in different pieces of recruiting and and training and leadership development and, and all of that good stuff. So after my husband passed, when I transitioned back to the workplace, I found that there was just this huge disconnect between the expectations of corporate America and humans <laughs> and what we are capable of doing and, and how we process in the midst of such a delicate time. And, and so when I experienced this firsthand, uh, my immediate re- response was, how can I use this to help other people? Now, part of it was helping individuals because we definitely need help in navigating grief. It's such a a complex journey and it doesn't look the same for everybody. Um, But we also need help interacting with people who are going through their own grief journey. And so that's where my heart was initially led. Although there were one-off individuals, you know, who I was helping along the way, I really honed in on creating workshops or, or, um, training and leadership development tools that would help people to manage grief in the workplace. So my company, we developed the four pillars of practical empathy, and those are awareness, communication, support, and productivity. And so as I started down that journey of talking about grief in the workplace, there was a lot of resistance, as you can imagine. <laughs> people do, first of all, people don't want to admit to that there's this elephant in the room. Mm-hmm. Everybody is going through something. Grief is a, a universal human experience. And see, the biggest myth about grief is that we think it only occurs because of a death, but it actually comes from different losses or changes, right? It could be from becoming a caregiver to an elderly parent or, um, or, you know, finding out that somebody in your family or even yourself is diagnosed with a terminally ill, uh, illness, or, you know, there's so many different things, but again, it comes because of a change or a loss when we expect things to be different or better or more, and it just doesn't turn out that way. So as I started to just kind of break down all of these barriers and, and, these myths that are surrounded with grief, again, corporate America was not really receptive because by saying you want grief training would be admitting that you have a problem, Mm -hmm. right? Because grief is kind of looked at as a problem. Mm -hmm. And so I recognized this resistance and most of what I was teaching was really surrounded around compassion and empathy in the workplace. 
So I decided to just adjust slightly. And instead of leading with the problem, I lead now with the solution, which is compassion and empathy. And as I was pulling different resources and research articles and studies and all of this that just helps us to create a basic framework for human interaction in the workplace. Mm -hmm. As I was pulling that, I recognized, well, it still touches on grief in the workplace because if we are operating with compassion and empathy on a day-to-day basis, that's mastery preparation for the time of crisis, right? Mm -hmm. We're already connecting in this space that's just really vulnerable. You know, we've established trust and respect through kindness. So when somebody does hit a tough life situation, which inevitably happens to all of us, then at least your work family is prepared to walk through those tough times with you and handle that because you guys have already established this kind of workplace. So it's been a journey to get to this point, um, but I'm super grateful that I learned all that I did throughout this journey because it's helped me to serve my clients at a whole new level and not just the the basic leadership development. You know, it's it really is taking it up a notch. Excellent. So I like the fact that you've mentioned that you started to lead with a solution and you focus on empathy and compassion. And one of the things that we have identified in the whole client or customer experience is people are driven by how they feel. Their emotions Correct. play an integral part. Um, I, I think even more than the intellectual because the emotion drives how the intellectual will respond. And so could you share with us a little bit about empathy? I mean, I, I personally think that it's not something that you're born with. It's a learned behavior and it's all dependent on how you're socialized, what you're exposed to the behaviors that you see, you know, both from um, your environment that you're in, as well as maybe even from things that you're exposed to or stimulated by, like the television or even social media. But not everybody knows how to be empathetic. What is that really? Well, yes and no to that statement. Yes, it is. Um it is something that can be learned, but no, it's not something that people are just, um, uh, are, are only inheriting that ability through a learned in- environment. That's not the case. People are born with empathy. There are people who are born with um, a lack of empathy. <laughs> As a matter of fact, there's a chemi- chemical in the front part of our brain, in our amygdala, that triggers our emotions. And you, so you could live and be raised in a very compassionate home, but you were born kind of without feelings, right? You know, you don't, you don't get too riled up or, you know, something doesn't make you, but that doesn't mean that you didn't have an environment that included feelings and emotions and, you know, conversations around that. It really is how we're born. But even if people are born without or with a lack of, maybe they don't have a lot of empathy, um, you still can adopt behaviors and skills and habits that bring empathy into conversations and interactions. So that way the person who you are interacting with feels valued. And so empathy is really being able to feel and understand another person's uh, emotions and respond with care. So again, that feeling part may not be natural for some people, but you can try to understand where they're coming from and respond in an empathic way, right? So that's how it looks. And so as it pertains to the customer experience, um, you know, you may not be able to completely resonate with where this customer is coming from. And I'll give you an example. It's a personal example. I bought a new car at the end of last year year. And the sales team, they weren't that great. I'll be honest, but I needed to get out of my car. It had a hundred and like 40,000 miles on it. I mean, it was just not safe anymore. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of in a rush to get into this car and didn't do my due diligence on a few things that um, I noticed within 24 hours of driving off the lot. So I immediately contacted the sales team. They were not very responsive. So then I looked online for a customer service team. They were not very responsive. So being the person that I am, I'm just saying, well, this isn't okay, right? So I am going to do my due diligence. I contacted the corporate office to say, listen, there are a couple of defects and this is actually not safe. So I just purchased this car and we need to figure out a resolution. Now, 
up the chain of command, the customer service sucked. It was terrible. It oh was my. horrible. And I was telling them, like, the rear view camera is not working. That is a safety issue. If I run over a kid, do you think they're going to say, oops, that's our bad. Like, we should have responded <laughs> quickly to that email. No, I'm going to be the one who is dealing with the legal ramifications, right? Yep. So I'm pushing forward to say, no, this is not okay. I felt like there was a disconnect between kind of the first level of customer service and then once you get to the executive office. Because let me tell you, once I got to the executive office and there was an individual uh, who was assigned to work with me, he followed up. He was patient on the phone. He made sure that the service manager they got me in touch with was you know timely in his response. He, he kept me in the loop even if there was going to be a waiting period. He communicated that to me. And what he he did that was different than the first level of customer service was he empathized with the fact that we have a single mom here who has made a very large investment. And I'm not saying I got anything fancy, but when you purchase a car, lease a car, that's an investment, right? Mm -hmm. You are putting your credit on the stake and uh, on the line and all of that. So it's not something to be taken lightly. And so because of his understanding of where I was coming from and my position and my worry and concern, he made sure that he saw it all the way through, where on the front end, that didn't happen. Now, what did he do differently than the first people who maybe answered a call or answered an email? He didn't do much in the practical sense, right? Except for the fact that he took his time to patiently understand where I was coming from and communicate in a way that made me feel like I was being heard that my that my uh, purchase was valued, my position as a customer was valued, and he wanted to make sure that we found a resolution, right? He responded with care. So it didn't take him much, but just the way that he was on top of it made a world of difference because I was ready to just blast this company and say, <laughs> don't ever buy from them again. Oh and that's God. not my character, but it was just, I felt like they did not care that we had such a, a major issue. And it was only because, and I told him on our last call, I said, it is only because of you and how you resolve this that I feel satisfied. The first three months of this process, which I didn't mention, it took a long time to get to that point, but the first three months was treacherous. And because of this one person who showed compassion, who interacted with empathy, and who made sure that a resolution was done in a caring way, I felt like, okay, I'm okay. I, I could come back and buy another car from them. I know that sounds bad because it was such a crazy experience. <laughs> But he did resolve it with empathy. Amazing. So it's more about listening to what the person is saying to you, understanding where they're coming from and why this is a pain point for them. And as you said, responding in a way that, you know, oh, well, you know, no big deal. But instead, in a way that I understand where you're coming from and what can we do to make it better? Because it would seem from the first level of customer service that they were more concerned about making the sale and That's less about correct. providing after sale support to you. That's correct. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, it doesn't take a lot of time. No, it, it doesn't, doesn't even take a lot of effort. You are on the exact same call with the exact same person. And literally your tone can change and, and your active listening skills can change the trajectory of that outcome. Mm -hmm. You just have to decide while you are in the midst of that, how am I going to show up for this person? Am I going to be caring or am I going to be short and curt? You know, am I going to listen or am I just thinking about the next thing that I need to get done? Or am I begrudgingly going through, you know, the motions? Either way, you have a choice and the energy level is the same. <laughs> true. Very true. Amazing. So that's empathy. Now let's talk a little bit about compassion. Where does compassion come from? So I believe that the major difference between empathy and compassion is one word, action. Mm. We are meant to put compassion into action. It's how you are showing up for people, whether you're showing up for a colleague who's going through something, um, you know, that's difficult or whether, or the way, for example, this gentleman responded to me, you know, he made sure that he was calling every four days with an update to let me know what was going on. Cause I was really left in the dark and that was frustrating. Mm -hmm. So compassion is what you put into action. Empathy really is kind of the starting point is being like, like I said, 
said, being able to feel and understand and then choosing to respond in a certain way. But that response is your compassion. Now, one thing that I've done um, through agency is we created a compassion action plan. And what it does is it addresses, if you know somebody who has experienced uh, in the organization, who's experienced a major loss, and we just touched on five, because this is usually an activity that we do in workshops. Mm -hmm. Um, But for this ebook, what we did was we just put five in there. And so divorce, um, becoming a caregiver, uh, you know, death, we, we identify those and how can you put compassion into action? So if you just thought about it for a second, unique, and you thought about, okay, I know a, a colleague lost their spouse, we'll say, what is a way that I can show up for them? What would be one or two ideas that come to your mind? Well, they've lost um, a family member, you said, or a colleague. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, they've lost a family member. A okay. colleague has lost a family member, yeah. Okay, so they've lost a family member. And um, seeing that I experienced that similar situation last mm-hmm. year, <laughs> yeah. um, I would say what I, would have, what I looked for in people who showed compassion were people who came, they were just there. They were there to support me. It's simple mm-hmm. things like just coming over and, and sitting and talking just to have the companionship at that point in time, because you don't want to be alone because right. it's, it's, it's a, it's an experience of trauma and being alone, your mind wanders all over the place and you yeah. feel more lonely. So you kind of just want somebody to be there and you want right. them to know that you want them to be there without you having to tell them, I want you to be there. That's correct. And I'm going to pause there for a second. I'm going to ask you for another example, but pausing there for a second, that is another example of how it does not take much for you to just show up for somebody. Does it? No. I remember at my husband's funeral, I looked and I saw at least 20 people from my office who were there. And that just made me feel so supported because you're right. When we go through a major loss like that, somebody close to us, somebody within our inner family, right? Our intermediate family, Mm -hmm. then we usually go to this place of isolation in our minds because we're just, you get on this emotional roller coaster and there's so many complex feelings. It's hard to keep up with those thoughts. So you really feel emotionally and mentally drained. Mm -hmm. And so when you have people around you, as you mentioned, they help you to stay connected to life. Yes. So you're not just completely caught up in your head. You're not isolating yourself and then, you know, end up on this negative thought cycle and start spiraling downward, but you have somebody who's just present. And I had somebody, her name was Jamie. I actually mentioned her in my Ted talk because I mean this unique, she would just show up and just lay on the floor with me (laughs) or lay in my bed or we would like walk around target. I mean, she is one of my closest friends. And she told me later after hearing my Ted talk. So this was, you know, four years after this happened. Um, but she said, you know, I admitted to my husband almost every night when I came home, I don't know if I'm doing enough. I'm just, I don't know what else I'm supposed to do. So for four years, as I am relishing this friendship and I, it's, it's anchored in my mind as something to teach other people just show up. She didn't even realize that it had made an impact on my healing journey, yeah. but it made a huge impact. So you're right. I always tell people we all need a Jamie. <laughs> that's her <laughs> name. We all need a Jamie. So that's good. You're right. So the first thing is show up, right? Be present. But what's something else that you can do for a colleague? Something else that we could do. Um, well, when I lost my dad last year, um, it was also important that um, people were there to assist me with, um, I guess that would link back to being present, assist me with anything that, you know, low hanging fruits that, you know, would distract me or make me feel not supported. Correct. But the difference there is, is that what they did was they stepped in to respond to your basic needs Yes. because it could have been like handling bills. It could have been like handling, um, uh, other just logistics that when you're in that mental fog, you don't really have the capacity to do so. Mm -hmm. And so if you have people who you trust who are near you now, this could be different for colleagues, right? For colleagues showing up and and responding to basic needs is like making sure you have food. (laughs) Yeah. creating a food calendar, right? Or just saying, Hey, you know, it's okay if you need to take longer than five days, you know, because usually that's the bereavement period. It's like five days for somebody in your intermediate family, but they can say, you know what? I know you have this project going on. I'll help you with that. What's your client's name? Let me step in. Let just give me a couple of details and I'll go into the system and I'll figure out the rest, but you don't worry about it, right? That's responding to a basic need. That's helping them to keep their life a float 
And that is putting compassion into action. Mm, I get you. So show up and take action. That's right. Yeah. Very simple. You know, it's almost like if just listening to you speak, it seems like it's common sense. But I think sometimes people don't actually <laughs> fall into those because I'm sure it based on your experience and even in my experience, you can think of people who you thought would be doing certain things that weren't doing these things that you sure. said, you know, like yep. showing up and, and being active and showing compassion. And so is it that it comes innate? I mean, like with Jamie, for example, what was her driving desire to just always be there for you and be trying to, you know, support you? You know what it is in our world and in, in our society, it's just awkward Grief is just awkward. And some people feel like, oh, I don't know if I'll say the right thing. I don't know if I you know, have enough time to be there. Like what if it's just there, we come up with all of these different barriers in our mind and the difference between holding on to those barriers and acting like Jamie will say as a reference <laughs> point is she just leaned in without knowing if what she was doing was enough, but her heart just led her to do that. Right. Yeah. What happens is we stop our heart from responding naturally because then our mind starts to take over to think that we need to say the right thing. We have to be perfect on how we show up. What if it's not enough? What if, and we just start to, our heart and our mind starts to battle, but you're right. It is an innate response. It's just our mind can start to suppress that response because we start to feel awkward. And that's my mission is to make grief less awkward, right? Like let's talk about it. Let's talk about all of this. Cause again, it is a universal human experience. We are all going to go through it. So I think if we have these conversations, for example, you having me on the podcast, again, thank you, because it's helping to reach different people and to open up a different mindset so we can respond differently. Because right now, we're just, we're perpetuating um, suppression and isolation, and that's what's making our journeys unhealthy. Mm -hmm. If we just opened our heart up to respond in a natural way, that doesn't look perfect. And here's an example. If somebody at work tells you, I just found out, you know, that my spouse has cancer. I have cancer. Instead of not knowing what to say and then not saying anything, which is actually worse, <laughs> do not say it. Like, if, seriously, if somebody didn't acknowledge or say, and it's the first time seeing them that Richard had died, I felt like, well, wow, that was kind of a big deal. Like, we're not going to say anything about it. You know, we don't have to go down the rabbit hole. But anyhow, if somebody shares some tragic news with you, you can say this, you can say, I am so sorry that you're going through this. And, you know, we don't know what is going to happen at the end of the day, but I know you are strong. I know that you have this light inside of you that you can just push through. And, and I'm here with you. Like anything that you need work related, if you just need to take a walk, if you, you know, need to get out of the office, or if you just need somebody to talk to for a few minutes, just, just know that you're not alone, mm -hmm. right? That's not giving, um, false hope. That's not saying everything's going to be great or just pray on it or da, da, da. like it's not giving any of that. It's just saying I'm meeting you where you are. And yeah, this is hard. Yeah, this sucks. But you're not alone. Mm -hmm. That is enough. What do you think about situations when you someone shares with you, for example, you know, that they had a, a tragedy and they're going through grief and it, like it, like a death, for example. And the person responds and says, you know, I know exactly what you're going through mm -hmm. um, because I find that grief is different for everyone. And, you know, you yeah. may lose someone and you respond in a different way. It impacts you in a different way. And I may lose someone and it may not impact me in that way. Or, you know, it might impact right. me worse or less. So is it, is it, do you think it's safe to say, you know, I, I know exactly what you're going through? How do you know? So I think that is another um, uncomfortable yet common response because <laughs> Because it's true. It's a common response but only because people feel uncomfortable, right? And they're just kind of like, ah, what do I say? And it just comes out so naturally. And that's not really what they mean, right? They're not saying, I know exactly what you're going through because somebody has said that to me and I'm like, oh, your husband's been murdered. Really? I, didn't, I didn't know that that happened to you. And, you know, not to even downplay it, but because some people will compare losses. They'll say, oh, well, I went through a divorce and so I know how that feels. Again, no, you don't know how it feels, but 
their heart is in the right place, right? Mm -hmm. So the first thing I would say is if you're on the receiving end of that comment is to give that person a little bit of grace because at least they're trying to be there, right? Mm -hmm. Do not take um, offense to that and kind of see through their words to see their heart and their intentions. And their heart and their intentions is to comfort you in the moment, right? Mm -hmm. but my advice to the person who wants to say that, and guess what? I have said that to people before in a different light, right? And before all of this happened, before I became more aware of some of the myths that we use to comfort people. Um, but if you are about to say that, hold your tongue real quick, and then just think about saying something along these lines. Again, I don't know what you're going through, but I went through a situation and I know that pain is real. I know that those hard times can come in waves. I know that sometimes it can just feel really consuming. And so if you feel anything that is just so painful and it feels hard for you to manage, you, you can come talk to me. I don't know what you're going through, but I know what pain feels like and I'm willing to just be here for you. Yeah. Because that is That it. sounds authentic. Right. And, yeah. it's, and it's true. It's true. It's authentic in the sense that I can relate to your pain, even though I haven't experienced the same loss. And here's the thing. Two siblings could lose the same parent and feel completely different about it. Of course. So, ima so imagine the differences of somebody who says, oh, I went through a divorce too. Or yeah, I also, you know, had a miscarriage or, oh, when my mom was sick or, and we compare them, but there's so many different factors that make that situation so different and unique, mm -hmm. but at least being able to relate through the pain, I think that's the authentic place to be. True. Or a similar one um, I found is a very taboo topic um, in Jamaica. It doesn't, I'm not sure if it's um, taboo in the United States, but I do find it's taboo in Jamaica is um, incest and abuse. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when I hear people talk about, especially when you're talking to young girls to help them to move from, you know, that trauma and that experience, because it's something that stays with you for life. Mm -hmm. um, how you respond to them in terms of, you know, well, you made it through, you know, everything's going to be okay. Don't worry about it. Sometimes I think we have to be mindful of what we say, especially if we've never had the experience before. Right. And, you know, there are pains like that where, um, for example, I have a friend and her parents were not kind growing up. They just weren't. And she doesn't have a relationship with them now. Now, I don't know that she's experienced any kind of sexual abuse. I know that that has happened in her family, but she, you know, it did not happen to her. However, the abandonment of your parents and them not wanting to be with you, it's a pain that stays with you through adulthood, right? Mm -hmm. A physical kind of trauma is also something that stays with you through adulthood. And sometimes you have to see your abuser, right? And so it's like, how do you live in that space? So what I encourage people to do is to create healthy boundaries that may not, ha they can't always be physical. A lot of times they have to be mental and emotional. So the person, again, who is hearing something like that, they're on the receiving end of that comment, you have to create an emotional and mental boundary just knowing that whatever they're saying to me, if it is not resonating with my heart with pure comfort and peace and, and even um, uh, empathy, then I'm not going to receive that. You choose if you're going to receive their words or not, right? Mm -hmm. Now, for the person who is trying to uh, comfort or uh, um, build them up, because a lot of times they're thinking, if you've been a victim, what I need to do is pour into you that you are strong, pour into you that you have gotten over it, you know, kind of build up your confidence and resilience. But again, sometimes we just fumble over those words. And so instead of saying something that is diminishing their past, meet them where they are, a Again, the same starting. I can't imagine what you have gone through, but I see who you are today and I see that you are a fighter. I see that you are a survivor. And even if those pains are still being held with you, which I'm sure that they are, I can only imagine that they are. There is something in you that is not giving up and I admire that in you. That is truth. Yeah, that is absolute truth. It does not diminish the pain that they have experienced, but is a, it is uplifting them to say, I have seen that you did not give up and I applaud you for that. But it is OK if you're still feeling and battling all of the wounds, the emotional wounds, the mental wounds that you carry with you. But it still it uplifts them and it builds them up. And that's at the end of the day, what we should be doing for each other is to build one another up so we feel safe, so we feel protected. So 
empathy and compassion for the workplace now. You've been through a few organizations, I'm sure, small, medium, and large. What do you find are some of the key characteristics that a leader should have in order to build teams where people trust each other, they feel loyal, um, they will perform and go above and beyond, even if their boss doesn't ask them to, they're going to do it because they want to do it. Do you think that traits of empathy and compassion are required more than the traits of like technical competencies of doing the job because those things have to build the relationships? Absolutely. You know, one of my favorite Richard Branson quotes is when you take care of your people, your people will take care of your business. And that is the absolute truth. You know, a lot of times leaders are driven by the numbers and the data, but you have to remember there are people behind those numbers and that data. <laughs> they didn't just magically appear. This is coming from somebody's, um, you know, knowledge capacity, their relationship building, their goal setting. Like there are people who are driving these numbers. Mm-hmm. And so you have to get to the source of your success. The source of your success is your people. And how you treat people is how they produce at work. Now, a lot of times people, I, I kind of hear two things the, most often. One is, leaders say, I want to be a better leader. I want to connect with my people. I want to um, help them in a different way, you know, basically build up their personal success, but I don't know how. Mm. And that's because we have to kind of get past that old adage of leave your personal stuff at the door, you know, just come Yes. And so I think that, again, leaders want to, but we are shifting society and we're shifting how we show up at work. So that's why it's such a great time to um, really live out my passion because people are more receptive to this message and they need just some structure, some framework behind it. Um, So that's the first thing. But then the other thing is there are leaders who are naturally showing up with kindness and they are seeing just I mean, amazing, powerful results. And an example of this is uh, one of my clients from Sprint. Uh, This gentleman is the general manager of uh, one of their four business units. And they have been the number one team for the last 15 years straight. Wow. 15 years, they have consistently outperformed the rest of the company. And I ended up, uh, when I met him, I asked him to come on to my podcast, Invest Human. And I said, we just need to talk about what this is. And he said one word, kindness. It is all about how you treat your people. Now, when I go into organizations, I break this down through like communication, interactions, conflict resolution, like how do we bring it into that? But it really all has to do with kindness because when you treat people well, then employees become more enthusiastic about their work. Mm -hmm. And if they are enthusiastic about their work, what happens to their performance? It improves. That's right. What happens to the customer experience because of the person that they're interacting with? They're more satisfied. That's exactly right. I mean, again, a no brainer. (laughs) It feels (laughs) like it should be a no brainer. But I think what the shift that's happening is that people just kind of need permission and they need that framework because for so long we've lived in the space of kind of being robotic at work and only expecting or evaluating um, someone's performance and not opening up the experience, the actual employee experience. Wow. Amazing. So the interpersonal skills, the soft skills, um, showing kindness, ensuring that you exercise empathy and compassion. Those are definitely characteristics and traits that as a leader will take you much further than any technical competence. Yes. Absolutely. All right. Could you share with our listeners, how do you stay motivated every day? Because you have to be motivating everyone when you are faced with challenges um, or griefs or obstacles that you have to overcome in your own life. How do you get up and stay motivated every day? Because you need to be the role model for the persons that you're trying to motivate. Mm, That is such a good question. You know, I don't live in a constant state of motivation. I'll just be honest. (laughs) I I do. I've learned through different, you know, like, uh, what are they called? Those um, personality tests and stuff that Mm -hmm. I I do have a natural personality that is drawn to the silver lining. Mm -hmm. Um, So I don't stay in a dark place for too long. However, when you've experienced this kind of tragedy, you can't help but to be in a dark space for a while. So What I learned during that time, my most trying time so far in my life was it was, it's absolutely critical for us 
to build a foundation of healthy habits so that we can navigate any hard time when it comes. Because guess what? Life isn't fair. So you're not going to go just through one thing. It's not a one and done. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And there are everyday stressors that we have to work through, you know, relationships, traffic, uh, you know, somebody late and, and, uh, I don't know, personalities that are not meshing. I mean, there's just so many different stressors that can make us feel weary and burnt out. Right. So it's not that you can live in this constant state of up because what goes up must come down, Mm -hmm. but you have to learn to find that balance when you do come down and, and how do you take care of yourself? So for me, whenever I'm going through a challenging time, you know, small or, or large, um, it's just a matter of tapping into those habits that I, I established when I was in the midst of my darkest hours with grief. And I wasn't intentional then. I just kind of, I was very set on my why. My why was my son. I knew that I wanted to um, be a good mom for him and and didn't want to be uh, living in this state of like brokenness and and, in this victim mindset. Like I wouldn't have been healthy for him in, Mm -hmm. in the long run. And so as I focused on that, him, then I started to create these healthy habits that just made a huge impact on my total well-being. Um, So when you are feeling down, you know, take a break. That's okay. Go for a walk, you know, do a breathing exercise. I mean, there's so many different habits on your mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical well-being that once you know what those habits are, then you can tap into them regardless of the low that you're feeling because they are tried and true. true. They help you in a dark, dark place or they help you in a I'm frustrated and burnt out place as well. <laughs> yeah, true. Very true. All right. So what's the one online resource, tool, website or app that you couldn't absolutely live without in your business or even in your life? Do you have one of those? Well, let's see. I would have to answer two ways. One is I really strive for um, strong organizational skills. I have very strong organizational skills, um, but I do that because I have a bad memory. (laughs) (laughs) I do. I'm just going to be vulnerable here for a second, but I I recognize that my mind being an entrepreneur, being a, a, a single mom, you know, having experienced trauma, I just have a bad memory. And so I compensate by having really strong organizational skills. And one of the um, tools that I love is Google keep K E E P. It helps me because I just, allows me to brain dump. And when I am able to brain dump all of the different distractions that come into my mind, I'm creating that space of mental clarity so that I can stay focused on my priorities. So Google Keep has been really helpful. Um, But there was also an app that helped me early on in my grief with mindfulness and meditation, and that was called Headspace. And I just signed up for the free version um, because I wanted to see what it was about. And it helped me because a lot of times we get into negative thought cycles at night before we're going to sleep, right? Our mind is just racing and then we start feeling like I don't have enough time. What do I do tomorrow? Did I not do this today? And so that on top of any kind of trauma that you may be working through, Headspace taught a breathing pattern that I was even able to teach to my son that at night, if I can't fall asleep, it works wonders. And so it's really, really, really simple. It's just a matter of counting your breaths when you inhale and exhale. When you inhale, you count one. When you exhale, two. Inhale again, three, and so on up to 10. You don't change your your breathing pattern. You're not you don't have to take long, deep breaths, but when you get to 10, you start back at one. And there's something about that, that I could do that three, maybe four times at the most. And then I pass out, I'm knocked out. <laughs> so wow. it just, it's taught me such a powerful breathing technique that I share that with almost anybody I interact with, because I think we're all a victim of, you know, those nighttime blues when it's kind of hard to fall asleep. Very true. Um, it seems to be a popular app. I haven't, I've actually downloaded it on my phone, but I haven't clicked on it, um, as yet because things have been so busy. But I had a guest that was on our podcast maybe two, three weeks ago. And Mm -hmm. that was one of his recommendations. Mm -hmm. Um, So, um, you know, I find it interesting that um, shortly after I'm getting the same recommendation. So the app must be really good. So I Mm -hmm. think today I'm going to make sure I click on the app since it's on the phone and I haven't actually used it yet to see what it's all about. I have no problems falling asleep, though. But I do have sometimes I do get distracted, like I'm, you know, doing something and I start thinking about something else and I jump from one thing to the next. So if Headspace can help me to refocus at times, that would be wonderful. 
Yeah, I think that it, it definitely, what I liked about it most was in the free version, it teaches you where some people just embark on this like meditation journey and you're like, ah, how do I do this? I'm falling asleep. No, wait, I can't stop these thoughts. You know, just <laughs> it, there's so many uh, barriers, we'll say. And I liked how in the free version, it actually teaches you some of the um, techniques that are helpful. Lovely. All right. Now, can you share with us any books that have had the greatest or biggest impact on you? Woo, a lot. Um, I'll tell you a secret. I was not a reader until I was 30 years old. <laughs> wow. I, I hated reading growing up, but uh, but after my husband died, I became obsessed with reading about heaven because I just needed that confirmation that he was okay and I would see him again. And that's what kind of got me down this journey. So um, I'll say the two, There's, I mean, there really are so many, but two that I think made such a huge impact were one was mindset by Carol Dweck. It teaches you how you can change your mindset from being a victim or living a fixed mindset to having a growth mindset. Mm -hmm. And again, it gives applicable takeaways on how you can teach even children, how you can teach, whether you're a teacher, a parent, a coach, it just helps in that state, how you can also use it in the workplace. So mindset by Carol Dweck was amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also it's kind of a tie between these two life's golden ticket by Brendan Burchard, because it does, it's a fiction book, but it gives you this, um, visualization of you having a choice and kind of revisiting different people or moments in your past that have led you up to where you are today and accept where you are today so that you can move forward. Um, so that's one. And then the other one is The Alchemist, which I know is a lot of people's favorites. Um, <laughs> but it's one of mine particularly because it was suggested to me uh, probably almost three years ago now. But I just read it at the end of last year. And I believe in in just divine timing. And it came at, at the time it came to my life, I wasn't ready to read it. But when I read it, it was exactly the time that I was supposed to just digest that. So it's a great book, again, for people who are just wondering, man, does all of this mean something? You know, how do I know I'm headed down the right path? Um, so that's why I love that book so much. Amazing. All right. So we're going to have those books that Karen shared with us in the show notes of this episode. So you can all look out for that information. All right, Karen. Now, what's one thing that's going on in your life right now that you're really excited about? Either something that you're working on to develop yourself or your people. Yes, I am super excited about launching my new group, group coaching program. Um, so I'm going to be doing uh, group coaching and it is called Soul Care Coaching with Karen. And so I, I want to create a network. Um, this, this specific offer is for women, but I want to create a network for women where they are able to just grow. They are able to find healing and just become the best version of their self. And so just sharing myself and stories, but also uh, sharing other coaches along the way. So I'm really excited about that. But then I also launched my first e-course, uh, Heal Forward. And that's for anybody who has experienced a, a major loss or a hardship, or they're just feeling depleted in life and they want to heal and move forward. It's a six week series um, that just gives a whole bunch of self-care habits and tips worksheets, videos, all that good stuff. It loads you up so that you can build that foundation that I talked about of healthy habits. So I'm excited about those two. They, uh, the e-course just launched and the coaching will launch in March. Nice. Very good. So to dovetail nicely into our next question, if our listeners want to take part in your e-course or they'd like to be members of your group coaching, where can they find you online? So easy. If you just go to Karen Millsap and Millsap has two L's, KarenMillsap.com, you can find everything there. You can get connected with the GrowFlow community. You can sign up for, uh, get your name on the list for coaching. You can also sign up for any courses. And as we, you know, put out more courses, but KarenMillsap.com is the hub for all resources and a lot of free stuff too. Nice. Very good. Now, Karen, before we wrap this interview up, we would like you to share with us a quote or a saying that during times of adversity, you tend to revert to that quote or saying to help you to refocus or recenter so that you can move forward. Do you have one of those? I do. And ironically, it is a little, um, 
it's like a little plaque that I found and it's on my desk. I'm looking at it right now. (laughs) It is my favorite. It says everything's going to be all right. Yep. Bob Bob Marley said that. Yes. (laughs) But I like how it says, yep. Even that one thing. Cause it's like, yeah, you can get really stuck on something. It's like, no, no, no. Everything is going to be okay. Even that one thing. And I love me some Bob Marley. So trust me, it resonated (laughs) right away. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> very nice so everything is gonna be all right i love it all right well thank you so much karen for taking time out of your very busy schedule and you know i just want to say um graciously from the bottom of my heart you were so receptive when i reached out to you you didn't know me you know you were you know i was sitting down one morning watching good morning america and i heard robin talking about you and what you were doing and i was like oh my goodness this woman is amazing and i went online and i looked you up and i said you an email and you responded and I'm telling you that is something that doesn't happen very often that people respond and I appreciate the fact that you responded and you so graciously accepted our invitation to be on this podcast because I think what you shared with us will be of so much value it's been of value to me and I just can't imagine how much value it will be to the listeners of this podcast Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. You know, I had somebody say that also. They said, oh, you're just so receptive. And I said, well, you know, my mission is to create a healing movement in this world. And if I did not respond, then I would be doing my mission an injustice. Yes, so yes. The more people who hear this story, uh, you know, whether it's they hear or they've heard it first because of the loss of my husband or they hear it for other reasons, the point is I, I hope that they are moved to just make a uh, change in their life because all of us have an opportunity to create a ripple effect in the world around us. So thank you for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to share the message with your audience. Thank you, Karen. So until next time, feel free to follow us on Twitter at Navigating CX. And if you'd like to join our private Facebook group, it's Navigating the Customer Experience Community. So until next time, I'm your host, Yannick Grant. Thanks for listening. For more awesome resources to take your customer service game to another level, head over to navigatingthecustomerexperience.com. See you next time.